talking with Dr. Michael Sala about a lot of very interesting things. We're sort of stuck in a a coasting phase here now. Uh, the government is probably trying to decide uh, when it's time to give up this this ludicrous cover up that they've been maintaining for sixty five years plus, and I don't know who's going to win. I again don't really care because I think people like uh, Bill Tompkins and others, Dr. Bob Wood and and so many others over the years who've been on this program who have come forward telling their stories, telling what they've seen, uh, leads us to the point now where we know there are things flying around above us, machines that land, that that leave Earth, that can do incredible things that shouldn't be able to be done in terms of physics, but do, uh, that are, uh, in all probability, in many cases, ours. Uh, because of the advanced technology that Bill Tompkins learned about in the early 1940s from the German spies, our spies on Germany who were brought back, they're Americans, who came back here to report and were debriefed, and he was able to watch these uh, and interact with these people. So he learned early on during the war years that the technology was already there to take us off planet. There was a, a fellow in England, John, what's his name, Walston, I think I want to say, he had a, a telescope and was able to capture uh, items that were in orbit, uh, rather deep orbit, around Earth that were parked there. And these look like enormous spaceships. Not Buck Rogers kinds of things, but just more like you'd see in uh, 2001, A Space Odyssey. Do you remember seeing any of these pictures, Michael, when they came out? I had many of them on the site. John Walson, I think was his name. He went by that name right. anyway. Yes, I, I remember seeing some of those pictures, and they kind of um, uh, substantiate yeah. that uh, there was a secret set of uh, space stations in orbit around the Earth. And I, I think that this is one of the aspects of the secret space programs as they've developed, that there, there are several of them um, that we need to kind of like look at in terms of having developed concurrently, which which is something that's very important. You know, we've talked about you know what the Nazis did in in South America and Antarctica. Um, Bill Tompkins talked about uh, what the Navy was doing in terms of uh, developing these um, these battle groups, these kilometer long right. space cruisers right. and uh, uh, carriers that were basically going to be deployed in deep space but I think uh, especially in the United States as, as you know all the different military services they tend to kind of develop particular areas of expertise yeah. and I, I think I think the Air Force and the National Reconnaissance Office uh, they were tapped to look after near Earth orbits um, basically make sure that um, any traffic to the Earth was was under surveillance and to kind of like uh, form a last line of defense, if you like, against any kind of attack against the Earth. That I, I think that in terms of the military thinking, mm -hmm. um, that would make sense. So you, you have the Navy out there with their uh, forward deployed space battle groups um, and if anything got through the Navy, um, battle groups, then you would have the NRO, Air Force, space platforms with all of these advanced weapons, directed energy weapons technologies up there that uh, you know, fulfilled a number of functions, uh, you know, partly surveillance, um, then also uh, defense, um, and then also kind of attack against any satellites uh, that were deployed by nations who might have in any way interfered with the plans. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And, uh, and uh, I found it very interesting, and I'm sure you probably covered this material at some point, the information from Peter Beter uh, from yeah. uh, the late 70s to, yeah. I think it was yeah. 82, where there were these uh, wars or these battles between the uh, Air Force and the, the Russians up there. And I, and I think that kind of makes a lot of sense that there was this kind of effort to find out who would basically be in control of near-Earth orbit operations and, and that uh, the, the Russians developed these cosmospheres and they basically competed against the, um, you know, the NRO and the Air Force for, for dominance and then eventually they reached some accommodation. 
Yeah, that would have been the Soviets, of course. This uh, Peter Beter is a very interesting figure who has all but vanished from history. He's just not talked about anymore, and he he's worth uh, he's well worth taking a look at, folks. If you're interested in doing some research, B E T E R, Peter Beter. Those pictures that I alluded to earlier, that John uh, was able to to image with his telescope and recorded on his video recorder. And he used to send them to me all the time. He's pulled a lot of them down. But they they obviously, clearly, with no ambiguity, were enormous machines up there. And they looked rather like that we would be building things like that. They were square, they were long, they were this, they were that. They weren't very strange, sci-fi-looking, uh, curvy, smooth craft. They were just... Uh, enormous constructs and it it all fits and then i found out as you did that we have at least two and this is going back 15 20 years two satellites at uh stable geosync orbits 18,000 miles out whose job it is is to watch the planet and log all traffic coming and going to it uh this this told me a lot too back then that there's a, a whole different thing going on the, the NASA space program, and this doesn't demean the participation or the bravery of the astronauts involved, some gave their lives, uh, was basically a, a misdirection, a canard. Uh, we were so far ahead of that and are. It's, it's not funny. But when you have a program like the Apollo program with an enormous rocket, the Saturn V, and all of a sudden the plug is pulled on the program to the extent that the Saturn V booster is destroyed, the equipment that made it is destroyed, the blueprints that design and engineers used to construct them were allegedly destroyed as well. You say, what the hell is going on here? Uh, so, yeah, I agree. It's, uh, it's too obvious that there are things far in excess of what the mainstream media tells Mr. and Mrs. America uh, are going on out there. Now, I had a, got an email here. Can you please ask uh, Dr. Sala, did the university tell him that USO, UFOs are not real and that's the reason you're not to teach about them? Did they tell you that they weren't real? Or the truth that UFOs exist was too shocking to teach about? Did you, what was, did you ever get any ambiguous messages from them about their position on this thing? Did anyone admit to you that, yeah, they're there, but we just don't talk about that? Um, what I was told was that basically that this area of research that I was doing was not appropriate for the university, and I actually got it in writing. So they you know, they sent me a, a letter of dismissal, and, and they and they huh. just said exactly uh-huh. that, that that my new area of research was not appropriate for the university, and uh, and this was a time to kind of like separate. Um, so yeah, definitely just a, a topic that they mm-hmm. felt uh, was just not something... Sounds like they stepped around it uh, rather gently, uh-huh, in a way, although being fired is never gentle. Uh, I, I, I think that given the grant money that keeps the universities functioning, uh, people were well aware of what's at some level going on here. They almost have to be. I remember, I remember talking to the dean of the school um, and, and talking all about uh, the, the disclosure project and the, the evidence of, of uh, the cover-up and all of these witnesses out there and, and basically saying, well, this is an, an area that really is very important and it's going to change uh, how international studies is understood in the future. And uh, the, the dean completely agreed with me, but he just said, uh, well, you know, when, when the official disclosure happens, then we'll just get a couple of uh, our professors to kind of like... Uh, read up on the literature and start teaching courses, <laughs> but they oh. don't have anything to do with it. <laughs> That's funny. But, yeah. We've talked about the uh, the atomic explosions in the Antarctic in 1958, three of them, high, supposedly high altitude. I've got that from two different uh, sources I was able to track down. So they weren't ground bursts. They were uh, more EMF uh, kind of thing. Uh, maybe they were warnings, uh, threatening uh, to the Soviets to let them know that, hey, there's nowhere you can hide. I, I don't know. It was Cold War time, 1958. 
Things were just getting hotter and hotter all the time. And we had the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962. I, I was just going to just quickly add there. I, I think uh, that one of the things, um, if it's true that the that the U.S. military industrial complex began cooperating with the Nazis in Antarctica, um, then I think it would have been in the interest of the U.S. Uh, to make the Soviets believe that nothing was happening, and so uh, detonating um, atomic uh, uh, weapons down there uh-huh. might be one of the ways to do that to kind of like fool them into thinking that well no uh, yeah. if there were yeah. joint bases then uh, you know they've been destroyed or they wouldn't be functioning any longer but but I think uh, the the US definitely has been involved in uh, operations down there for a long time oh yes and I I think that uh, we have our underground boring and tunneling machines that are capable of extraordinary uh, feats underground at a, a very rapid rate and may well have honeycombed uh, much of Antarctic. The Antarctic, it's, remember, it's not all ice like the Arctic is, folks. It's, it's a landmass. It's a continent. And so you've got all the features there that we have here. Mountains, lakes, underground rivers, all kinds of things. Corey Good and Tompkins, secret think tanks. Tell us, tell us your overview on that. So a lot of people don't know who Corey Good is, so let's do a little background on Corey. Sure. Well, he is someone that uh, says that he served in the secret space programs uh, from 1987 to 2007, that he worked on a number of programs, beginning with the Solar Warden program that was run by the, by the Navy, that he mm-hmm. served on a research vessel for about six years, and then he uh, was reassigned to another branch of the secret space programs doing um, other work related to um, interrogation of uh, uh, extraterrestrial visitors, uh, trying to extract information. Um, and so he, after a 20-year tour of duty, um, th- where during that time, uh, as part of his duties, he says that uh, to properly conduct these duties as an intuitive empath because he was a, his job was to kind of like determine whether people were telling the truth or not. And so a decision was made by someone that in order for him to better be able to do that job, that it was good for him to be able to uh, brief himself or have access to briefing documents uh, describing all aspects of the secret space programs in terms of uh, how many there are, you know, what, the history of it. Right. Um, and that's so a, this, that's the big this, secret. This, this, Boy, that's, that's, uh, that's the big exactly. secret. Yeah. So he says he had access to these smart glass pads, similar to an iPad, but just fully transparent glass, uh-huh. and that during his um, service, during his downtime, and even sometimes when he was on official duty, that, that he would just be going, reading through this thing, reading all about uh, the, the history of the programs, the different um, missions, the different colonies, colonies on the moon, colonies on Mars, bases on the, on the, uh, on the um, some of the moons of the outer planets, and uh, he, uh, reading about the history of the Germans and how the Germans uh, developed their space programs, that this was everything that he was reading on the smart glass pads. And this and, occurred uh, while he was off planet. Exactly. So from 1987 to 2007, mm-hmm. he served for 20 years, and at the completion of that 20-year service, where he's reading all of this information, He's also performing all of these off-world missions. Um, then um, his time of uh, service is over. Mm-hmm. So uh, the first thing they did to him was that they, you know, did a thorough, a thorough debrief, where he basically said everything that he could remember about what happened. Then they mm-hmm. uh, essentially um, put him in this uh, age regression mas- uh, machine, where they regressed him physically in age. 20 years and and then uh, then they basically sent him back in time 20 years so he's now sent back 
um, from 2007, he's been age regressed physically 20 years back to 1980, uh, 1986, 87, and and then he's subjected to another debrief, and then his mind is wiped, and uh, he's returned home only minutes after he was originally picked up for his 20-year tour of duty, mm-hmm. which which sounds incredible. Um, uh, he's he's not the first whistleblower to say that he went through this. Uh, there have been others before him. Michael Ralph, the Mars whistleblower, said he did the same. That something like that happened to him from 1976 to 1996. Mm-hmm. Um, another whistleblower just before Corey Good came on the scene, uh, Randy Kramer or Captain K, said that he also went through a similar 20-year tour of duty and then age regression, 1987 to 2000. In seven, uh, you know, so you have three different whistleblowers saying they have gone through a similar process. Up yeah, they call it twenty and back. Exactly, the twenty and back. But then you have William Tompkins coming forward, and not only does William Tompkins confirm a lot of the information that Corey Good said uh, he uh, w- experienced and saw, mm-hmm. um, but. William Tompkins also said that he had a hand in the development of the age regression technology. That back from uh, nine, uh, back in 1967 to 1971, when he worked at TRW, I think you, you covered this on one of the shows. Yeah. That that he worked on developing this technology, and that he that it was something that was developed to the extent where eventually it was used on these uh, 20 and back personnel. So you have Tompkins now, you know, with all of his testimony and his credentials and the documents he has supporting his background saying that he went, that uh, he did work on this stuff. Um, and, and, and one of the other things about Tompkins is that um, I was able to track down two Navy officers that worked with Tompkins um, out of the, the Navy League officers in uh, Medford, Oregon from 1985 to 1999 and, and they confirmed some of the things that Tompkins was saying about special projects, secret space programs and extraterrestrial life. So there you have uh, two, two witnesses, credible witnesses, actually confirming that Tompkins was playing a role in educating Navy officers and their children in the Sea Cadets about these kinds of off-world programs. That's fascinating. I, I'm, uh, I live about uh, 20 miles from Medford right now and had no idea that was going on up here. We've had some remarkable sightings over the years in this area. Mount Shasta is oh, 90 minutes south of where I am. I guess you're going to be appearing there this summer, aren't you, in a uh, conference? That's right. Yes, I'm going to be there in uh, end of uh, end of uh, August with uh, Corey Good and a couple of other uh, presenters. Uh, and, and what's interesting about Manchester is that uh, this, according to Bill Tompkins, was one of the special projects yeah. that was run out of Medford. That uh, they they had a lot of Navy pilots flying around Manchester trying to spot the passageways or the entrances into the underground bases uh, used by the extraterrestrials or the you know, Earth um, beings or civilizations that, that were using Mount Shasta as their kind of uh, hidden base. So this was something else that, uh, that Tompkins said was uh, happening up there at Medford. And, uh, and the, as I said, there were two Navy officers that have said that, yes, uh, Tompkins was indeed talking about these things. 